So we are here with another edition of Musician Accents. I am with uh, the North State Symphony Principal Horn, Robert Fon. Robert, how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. We had some uh, technical difficulties leading up to this recording. So <laughs> it's quite all right. Uh, but uh, it seems uh, like a, a normal for the world we're living in nowadays. Um, how how have you been holding up these? What it's almost been a year now. What ten months now? How, how's life been for you? It has it's been more than a year. It feels like, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's okay. I um, I was foolish enough to leave a, a position and uh, start a new position, but also turn down two positions on the way to this one in the middle of a pandemic. So you know, yeah. very low stress, really easy, fun, <laughs> all, the, all those sorts of things. So, so to backtrack a little bit, um, you've been with the North States Symphony. Let's see, your first season was 1819, correct? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think it was. So, so it's about three years now. Right, 1819. And uh, going into that year, the furthest a musician traveled to be part of the North States Symphony, I think, was either Tucson or L.A., and uh, you you just took that record and you you blew that out of the water because at the time you were living in Oklahoma. Yes. Yeah. So so you were already for all of our Masterworks concerts you were already traveling in a flight or two a train plane automobile you were you yeah. were you were doing the whole shebang and that's 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 yeah. dedication right there. Um, well, it was worth it to be honest with you. It's it's a it's a lovely little town, great group of people and some really fantastic host people that I've met along the way and I, it's worth it. We, we, you know, I think one of the special things about the symphony is definitely the relationships that the musicians have with the chair sponsors, with the hosts. And, uh, you know, it, it also gives them a, a, a unique perspective on the, the inner workings of the symphony. And we're happy that we're able to, to make that happen for them. But, okay. So before you were living in Oklahoma and you just took a new job and now you're in Memphis, Tennessee, correct? Yes. Now I'm the horn professor, officially visiting horn professor, but hopefully that'll change soon. Uh, at the University of Memphis, uh, Rudy E. Scheidt School of Music. That's the mm -hmm. official title. So awesome. It's, um, it's a large, it's a large university. It's the flagship university of the state. So they have bachelor's, master's, doctorates, artist diplomas, graduate certificates, you know, uh, 600 music majors, full size, full size deal here. <laughs> well, congratulations. Uh, you're in my home state now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so how's, how's everything been going in Memphis? How have, uh, how has the university there been adapting to a pandemic world? Well, uh, Memphis, Memphis health department is separate from the state of Tennessee. So mm. anything that you read in the newspaper that's going on in Tennessee is probably the exact opposite of here. So. Mm -hmm. um, starting in mm, last May or something, no building access anywhere without mask. Everyone's sent home. Um, staff, staff people, so office workers, et cetera, have not set foot in this building since last February, I believe, or January or February. Wow. There has not been an official, or, or has, hasn't been in a performance with a concert with an audience since February of last year. So it's been, it's been a year for the, for us at this place, but, um, we have stabilized our numbers in a way. So, uh, last semester, I think we allowed five or 6,000 kids to come to the, um, university to live in the dorms. Those are kids who are, um, have a difficult home life of some kind can't afford uh, internet or just need some situation of stability to achieve school. Mm -hmm. So we allowed them to come, but they are, they for, they have to get a test every week, um, and pretty strict. They do all their classes from their dorm room. They eat the same place at the same time, and, and I'm kind of proud to say that we did not have a single outbreak in a dorm room the entire fall, which is <laughs> pretty impressive. Our only uh, outbreak of the entire university was from the football team, and they went to play. Um, they were fantastic last year. They're mediocre this year, but had a lot of sitouts. They were going to the NFL or will be. Um, they got sick from the Arkansas team, actually. Oh, really? The Arkansas team had a bunch of very positive uh, test cases three days after we played them. And then lo and behold, we had some about a week and a half later. This semester is different, though. If I had to guess the number of kids on campus, I would say around 10,000 10, or so. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real, I think people are just fed up with not seeing friends, um, not 
doing their own thing, not being able to go to, no one enjoys Zoom classes, to be really honest with you. And um, I personally have been teaching all my horn lessons in person. Uh, I have a, I have a, a very large studio, so we can be about 15, 20 feet apart oh, wow. in, in my room. And um, so well, I've been having weekly lessons and weekly studio class, to be honest with you. And um, it's well ventilated, all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, the 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 studio class is in a giant choral rehearsal hall. There's only my predecessor left me a very small number of students, so it's a it's a it's a compact studio at the moment, hmm. which wow. I've been trying to rectify over COVID. So for me, it's been a real challenge just trying to like connect with the community. Um, you know, I can't go to the schools. I can't do any outreach. I can't do any concerts. I um, I've been coaching the Memphis Youth Orchestra online and going to schools online, and it's just not the same. So, no, nope, I think not. there's a real, real desire for the, for a lot of the university kids to just, just move on. They're, everyone's just waiting for the vaccine so we can get going. Well, uh, I think everybody's in the same boat at this point, and the, <laughs> the only way forward is to to realize that small sacrifices have to be made now for it not to last forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I, so, Shelby, Shelby County has been, um, it's been very good about it. Um, a lot of fights with the, <laughs> the governor's newest newest ploy is to, uh, the, the schools refuse to let any of the kids go to school at all. It's 100% mm -hmm. virtual. And the governor said that he is gonna pull funding from the county for public education if they don't send the schools, the kids to school for the rest of the semester. Rest oh, of the great. Year. Yeah, <laughs> and the, and the, the reply from the superintendent was, "We'll survive." I, I don't know how. I, it's mind-boggling to me. I don't know what we can do wow. without, without state federal funds, but we'll see. <laughs> well, crazy times, crazy times. Yeah. Let's let's hope that yeah. goes in a positive direction. But um, yeah. uh, let let's focus on you for a second. Um, yeah. So, how did you get started in music, and when? Did you first pick up the horn? Well, it's uh, I, I'm going to be very different than 99% of your answers, actually. So, <laughs> um, I was a kid born in a very small town, Alabama, mm -hmm. who spent most of his uh, elementary and high school years in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, and New York City. Uh, so I was always like one year in New York City, one year in Alabama, two years in Boston, two years in Alabama. It was back and forth the whole time with my father. Um, so I ended up skipping grades quickly. I actually finished high school when I was 15, 16, just before my 16th birthday. Oh, wow. And I went to LSU, of all places, mm -hmm. uh, when I was seven, 16, 17 years old and was a freshman, way too young, uh, just you know, on my own, striking out my own. I guess I did that a lot. And I was a pre-med major, and I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And um, my third year, so I was almost done with my bachelor's of science, thinking about applying to medical schools. Um, I had made one B, the only B of my entire lifetime. <laughs> and um, and my roommate was a music major. We were in the honors college, and he suggested that I take um, non-major lessons. He said, you don't necessarily have to be good at the instrument. You just have to show up and try. And I was like, well, show up and try is, you know, I'll do it. And we were watching Jurassic Park, and it starts with that awesome horn solo, which has been an obsession of mine my whole life, to be honest with you. And um, I said, well, I'll play that instrument. What is that? He goes, oh, that's the French horn. I was like, okay. So I signed up for the French horn. I took lessons with a graduate assistant, and I started skipping anatomy and other classes to um, practice, to be honest with you. And... Uh, I auditioned for music schools the next semester. Wow. Um, yeah. And I took off to uh, Oberlin Conservatory, and I'd been playing horn for about six months or something silly like that. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't have been at such a high-level conservatory, but they were just impressed at what I, the kind of work I was putting in. And um, so I was there, and I had a really great time with a really good teacher that I made a great connection with. And the university, uh, the conservatory didn't like him, so he was dismissed. And mm -hmm myself and my youthful arrogance was um well fine i will leave i'll teach you a lesson i'll leave <laughs> so, <laughs> that le lesson to be learned from everyone no institution is going to miss you <laughs> <laughs> no as, as much as we want to think they will they won't <laughs> yeah so i went to michigan and i finished my bachelor's at the university of michigan nice and i had a i had a really i had a godsend of a teacher uh, he was the retired professor and 
I went to his house Monday, Wednesday, Friday for about three, four or five hours at a time. I cut his grass or something like that. And I would just play. It would be like an hour of a lesson. He listened to me practice for an hour or two and then another hour lesson. He'd be yelling at me the whole time, including practice sessions. So it was like, it was very intense, but he never charged me a dime. And nice. it was always really great to me. Uh, that was Louis Stout, who was a co-principal horn Chicago Symphony with Philip Farkas. Okay, okay. He's an amazing person. And that's kind of how I emulate my teaching. I'll give you everything if you give it back. Right. That's the best way to go. Um, so you you finished your degree in Michigan. Did you did you finish a little bit later than an, uh, a regular uh, bachelor student? Uh, no, I, because I had started early and, and left. So I, you were still I, on track. Still wow. basically on track. I, mean, I think I was... I was 21, 22. That's, that's okay. pretty normal for our bachelors, I think. And then uh, you went to Boston. And then I went to Boston as an artist diploma. I was, I, I, again, so you went from probably, bachelor's to artist diploma. That was probably a hot wow. I really should have. Yeah. So while I was at NEC, where, which is where we met, I think you thought I was probably a freshman or something like that, or at least your, your, your bachelor's degree. But so I, I just I had a good time. NEC is a fabulous, fabulous school. And yeah, I, I, I really love the New England Conservatory. And, uh, you know, we, we met, of course, but what's great about NEC is it's it's a couple small buildings that house 600 music, you know, craving music students. And there's just so much energy that I, I felt every day walking through those halls. And it was it was inspiring yeah. every time I, I stepped foot on those those front steps. And that's what I love most about it. And uh, of course, you know, in addition to practicing, I played a lot of foosball and there was this whole click that, that did that <laughs> yeah. a lot of times. But, uh, you know, it's, it's it's part of my life that that I do miss. That, and one of those parts that if I could relive, it would definitely be that. And of course, in retrospect, I'd, I'd, I'd probably try to get a couple more hours in the practice room every day. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been back? Uh, I've been back a couple times. I haven't been back. Actually, the last time I was back was um, 2018, and I saw the new right. building. So uh, saw all the new buildings. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Very very unfair. But, right, but but nothing beats Jordan Hall. I mean, we we got to yeah. to live Jordan Hall. And that's that's the yeah. great thing about it. Yeah. So from any scene, did you see what they did to? Did you see what they did to the the old hospital building that was the classroom building? No, that, I haven't. Old, that old recital hall that was really long. It's something with a B, Bart, Bart something. Um, I'm just, I was going to ask you if you seen. Um, they had that long kind of recital hall that had windows on not Huntington but the other road, Gainsboro. Okay. And it used to be a hospital, but that was like a, a giant, really long room that had a teeny tiny wooden stage at the end of it. Botoff Hall, San Botoff. Oh, really? I knew yeah. it was to be. Did you see what they did to that building? That room? Oh, that whole mm -hmm. building. Actually. No, I don't. I don't think I went in there. So, well, they added the new building on top of it, and it went out and over to the old other building. But that hall, they completely gutted it and made it into a really pristine pine wooden box, essentially. Mm -hmm. Moved the stage from the end to the center, and has all this art all over it, and it's uh, the most technologically advanced thing in the entire university. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know you know, that that just makes sense because every recital they well, most recitals they had in there, most people played from the center of the room anyway. So I can I can yeah. see how that adjustment would be made. Um, I even did my my master's recital in that spot in the center. So yeah, that's where I did all of my artist diploma recitals, actually. Uh, okay. Um, they just never worked out. I know I was allowed to use Jordan, but they were always we we're always so picky with the dates. With the dates. <laughs> they claim that we have first priority, but what they really meant was if you play violin, you have first priority. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> so, so you went to NEC for an artist diploma, and and what was your your track after that? Um, I accepted the principal horn position of the Auckland Philharmonic, and so I moved to New Zealand. And um, uh, then I was on trial with the National Sym in New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. In, they call it NZSO. Um, and I was really enjoying it. I was so young, though. I think I was probably 24, 25, something like mm -hmm. that. The next youngest person in the orchestra was probably 40, something like that. It's not old at all. But at the time, I thought, look, if I just get a master's degree, I can be in the Berlin Philharmonic. <laughs> so, so I started applying for master's degrees. Like I said, I had this I had this insatiable drive, but I also had this crazy attitude when I was younger, I suppose. And I'm pretty embarrassed by it to be honest with you but um you know we all grow up in the time but so I spent a couple of seasons there and I really liked the NZSO and um I should have 
made more of an attempt to make that a permit position and I should have never have ever left. Mm -hmm. um, as we can see by COVID, it's a very well run place. <laughs> oh, definitely. My gosh, and, they're um, doing everything right down there. So I accepted a position at Indiana University. Um, but when I arrived, the funding had been destroyed by the by a certain person that um, runs that institution. Uh -huh. And um, so I transferred to CCM and had a full scholarship with probably one of the greatest horn pedagogues in the world, Randy Gardner. Mm -hmm. And I finished my master's. And after I finished my master's, I was, I was, uh, I won a position of visiting scholar at the Royal Northern Academy of College of mm -hmm. Music in Manchester, England. And I moved to England. Um, and while I was there, I won a uh, co-principal horn at London Chamber Orchestra. And that orchestra is a fantastic orchestra, but it's it's hard to understand the the the, the schedule they have. It could be very intense for a month, and then nothing for three months. And, it was a regular orchestra, but it was very sporadic. So while I was doing that, I was also uh, a 2D horn section member at Philharmonia der Nations in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So I was constantly back and forth between London and Berlin. And, wow. and um, then I just had this wild bee in my bonnet that I wanted to play some opera. And so the NCPA orchestra in Beijing, China was hiring a principal horn. So I went there. <laughs> and... <laughs> and, and um, Lauren Mazel passed away just before I started playing. Uh -huh. He was supposed to be the conductor. I see. And um, China is a very strange institution. Um, the orchestra. I just received a letter um, one day and saying uh, you'll be moving to Guiyang Symphony. This is a province in the far left. And and I went to talk to him. He said, Oh yeah, that, that's your new job. And I, I didn't understand that and and it had a plane ticket on it. And that's that's the way it was. You had you had a week to get your stuff ready to go. Mm -hmm. it turns out the conductor's brother is the governor of that province, and he was second or third in the Communist Party. And what he said goes. So he wanted to build an he wanted to build a private orchestra. It's the only private orchestra in the country. He mm -hmm. wanted to build a private orchestra as if he's the Habsburgs or something like that. And so he was just taking all the best players that he could find, or people he liked or heard word of, and brought us over there. So I had a horn section of another American, a French guy, and a Chinese uh, lady. And that was the Cosmo horn section of Guiyang. And after wow. a year, I, I left and returned to England. And uh, okay, to try to speed this up, because I know I can talk a lot. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but, um, the Tories got in charge at the, in England, although my uh, ex-wife was a British citizen. I had a full-time job and owned a department in London. Did not matter the way mm -hmm. the system worked. Um, so we were going to be forced to leave England eventually soon, very soon. And I started applying for professorships and and I got some interviews and runner ups and they were always wondering why I did not have a DMA. So I just mm -hmm. enrolled in a DMA program at the University of Wisconsin, finished that, started teaching part time at University of North Texas, then Oklahoma, and now Memphis. Wow. Kind of like the long way around. Mm -hmm. Lots of stops of festivals here and there and making some movies here and there and making some other CDs and radios and play a lot of opera, a lot of ballet. Opera is my favorite. It's just, um, there's really only one opera job in this entire country, and that's <laughs> it's kind of depressing. And right now, it's not even a job, which is more depressing. Right, um, right. But yeah. I, but I'm really hoping. I I know that the Chicago Lyric is a considered a full time job, and they don't play year round opera, and I, I really miss that. <laughs> um, they they do have an excellent season and an excellent orchestra, and but the Met is more of the place that I would dream to be in, but. Certainly, a, certainly, a, yeah, yeah, they're, you know, f treating their players not like one of the best orchestras in the world at the moment. So uh, yeah. I have a but... very good friend that I coached who's the second horn. He's very young. He's my, my age. And he's the new second horn in the Met. Mm -hmm. He just gained that position. I think he'd been there about a year, year and a half when this mm -hmm. started. Um, so he's just fresh out of school, young, has doesn't have the kind of funds. And so he had to get rid of his apartment and he moved back to Costa Rica. And he's just living in Costa Rica until the orchestra starts back up because he can't afford to live in New York City. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure there's a, a few stories similar to that. Yeah. Um, well, let's get on a, a, maybe a bit more positive subject matter here. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I didn't, um, mean, I didn't mean to bring it down at all. I was just trying to give you my no, no, no. It's the history of world travel. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. And I did a lot of that. I didn't know. Uh, you, you've certainly been in, a, in quite a few places. Um, 
Now let's, uh, I, you might've answered this already, but do you have a, a one moment in your life or one experience that, that solidified this career path? I know you mentioned Jurassic Park. Did, was that just starting the horn or did that say, I want to be a professional musician for you? How, how did that work out? Or was there another moment you can pinpoint? It's a really tough question because they've all kind of built and it's funny. I'd already, I have already made the idea to, to try to go to music school. Um, I, I guess an easier way for me to say is what confirmed it and guaranteed that I really wanted to do this was um, my first year at, at Michigan. I was lucky enough to, um, to be, to be accepted to the Aspen music festival. Mm -hmm. And so I showed up to Aspen and, and I was in way over my head, way over my head. Um, but I had some really great people and some really now fantastic people who have, I mean, have fantastic jobs they are fantastic then too. But the summer ended with me playing Mahler 3 with James Levine. And, and, and I just had the most fun. And I, I don't know, I was playing like 10th horn or something way down at the bottom. Uh, it was kind of like the, the pity assignment for the new guy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it really was... That was, that was when I knew that, yeah, I'm going to do this and nothing else. This is it. Like, um, I don't mind if I don't have a 30 bedroom mansion in Beverly Hills. Uh, I'm just happy. And that, that was kind of it. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah. when, when, uh, when you won this job at North State Symphony, one of the first conversations we had was, uh, about the season coming up and how you were looking forward to Brahms four. Yes. Um, which brings me to my next question. Do you have a favorite composer or is it just a, a favorite set of pieces that you, that you love to play? Well, the horn is super for non-musician people. It's the horn super fortunate that I, I think we have some sort of memorable, uh, mind dominating moment in just about every piece ever written. Um, and ironically, probably some of my absolute favorite pieces, which wouldn't be uh, Mozart's Requiem, for instance, is probably one of the few pieces you can find that don't have a horn in it, <laughs> so, which is a little bit surprising. But I don't, I don't feel like I could. It sounds so nerdy to say I cannot put Brahms over Mahler or Beethoven or anyone like that. You know, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I truly enjoy playing Haydn. I truly enjoy Mozart, but I also enjoy Stravinsky and 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 um gorb and schoenberg and not not the arnold adam <laughs> <laughs> nah, Ad Ad arnold's okay too for a couple pieces yeah um, but uh we're especially lucky with the horn and i i can literally only think of two pieces that don't involve the horn that are like world-renowned classical music that everyone knows and, and i feel very fortunate to, to be that and i feel more fortunate to play principal horn uh, often, uh, I, I don't demand that. I just get lucky with that. I, I work very hard for that. I do not believe in talent. I think it's always hard work mm -hmm. that makes it. Um, and, uh, I feel really fortunate to be able to come and play with you guys. Uh, I, it's been really odd to see, you know, like my computer or my phone would send a message. You haven't purchased a plane ticket in American airlines in a while. <laughs> and, 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 and that was never the case for a long time. Yeah. And and this feels very strange. And we'll be back soon, I think, in some form or another. And I really enjoyed the chamber music we were doing there. And I hope that that can be expanded. And, and this just not because I'm bucking for like a, a week-long vacation in California, which is always a plus. All right. Um, I just think the more exposure people have to the group and the people playing, the conversations waiting for the popcorn or waiting for the wine in between or what sell uh, people on classical music. Everyone, not everyone, I hear a lot of times younger people say, oh, I don't like classical music. Okay, but then they watch a movie and they're like, man, it sounds awesome. I'm like, yeah, it was written 300 years ago. You know? um, it just needs exposure. It just needs education, which is exactly what everything else in this country needs, exposure and education. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I certainly hope that we can all start buying plane tickets again soon and experiencing the power of live music and, and, and coming together as a community once again. Um, and uh, which brings me to uh, uh, my final question, since you, you know, your, your tenure with the North State Symphony has been kind of weird because, let's see, really, um, 
one and a half seasons ish now, if you don't count the mm-hmm. pandemic part of the season last year. Yeah. But um, in that time, do you have a, a a most memorable or a favorite performance with the symphony? Um. I think I've been really lucky. I think in all of my time, I've played every masterwork. I think I've done all of the kids' concerts. Um, the one thing I've seemed to miss is the Christmas concerts. I haven't got to experience the <laughs> Christmas one yet. It just never, it lines up with some family event or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I really, really, truly enjoyed that Brahms concert. Um, I love my section members and that was just a weird time because um, our second was having a, a child and right. and the others were pre-engaged with the military band and so I've, I, I had I I got to bring a whole bunch of students a bunch of my top end professional students and that was just a lot of fun we had we went we went hiking we went to San Francisco and we played some awesome Brahms and it was really strong it was a lot of fun that Brahms war was a really fantastic concert um, but I really enjoyed when we play, the concert we played Adam Schoenberg in Appalachian Springs. Those were both excellent concerts. I don't think there's been a one I don't like, to be honest with you. I think we, Greek, Greek Piano Concerto was a rocking concert. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I uh, the, the rehearsals that we did during the first, the first fire, I think that was Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. I don't think we got ended up not being able to play that. Or at least not in Chico. We played it in Reading. Right. We played in Reading. Where it was yeah. uh, Tchaikovsky and Mozart 40 and something yeah. else. I fantastic forget, but... concert. Fantastic yeah. concert. Really fantastic concert. And that was a strange time because the second horn was pregnant at that time. And <laughs> she didn't want to inhale smoke. Okay. Rightly so. Yeah. Uh, we, had bring, we had to bring someone in at the last minute. I can't even remember who it is. They concerts run together. And it's no offense to anyone I've ever played with. It's just... Mm-hmm. They run together, and you remember the feeling more than you remember every single moment of what note you missed or what was around your in front of you, behind you. You remember how it made you feel and how it bettered your life, and that and that's actually what music does. And I know that sounds like some sort of like TED talk, but it's the it's what it is. It's the truth. It's the truth. No, absolutely, I agree with you, Robert. And that that's that's a great way to. To end this conversation is just you know the the all encompassing power of music and uh, how much, even in times when we can't uh, you know make music in person, how much how how vital it is that we keep you know the arts and and creativity alive and uh, yeah. you know you know continue to tell that story, continue to make you know um, the, uh, all of our organizations relevant to the communities that we serve and and really dig in as far as we can and uh, when we all get out of this strange world we're living in we can uh, be all the stronger because of what we're doing now so yeah so here's to that you know we'll get there yeah. we'll get there yeah. it just takes a little time yeah, well robert exactly. thanks thanks so much for uh, for spending a, a few minutes with me and uh, uh for sharing your story with with our uh our symphony audience and uh, we look forward to collaborating in person again yeah i'm counting the days <laughs>